Uh, I just want to say how excited and slightly nervous I am to be here. Um, uh, and I'm, uh, it's a great uh, program that uh, Suparna has put together, and uh, it's good to be part of it. Um, I also, before I forget, I just want to thank the people in my lab who allow me to go around the world taking credit for what they do. Um, today, in particular, I'll be talking about the work of Matthias Gruber and Tanya Yonker for my lab. Um, now, uh, one of the things that, as a memory researcher, a fact of life that happens is, is that you sit next to someone on a plane, and you tell them, yes, I studied memory, and they say, can you make my memory better? And if you ever talk to anyone who's over the age of 30 and they tell, tell you, I've got a great memory, then you want to study them, because most of us aren't really happy with the way we remember. So at some point, I actually started to get interested in this idea that you know, we forget so much. Can we figure out a way to use what we've learned from cognitive neuroscience to actually improve the way we remember? And so I'm not going to give you a very theory-driven, coherent talk today, but rather I'm going to give you a couple of brain hacks that we've figured out in our lab, ways in which we think we can take what we've learned and use them to improve memory both in the lab and in the real world. Um, so one of them is the power of motivation. Um, you know, people typically, you know, as you know, a while ago, people used to talk about the study of learning and motivation as opposed to learning and memory. And in fact, even though we forget so much of our daily experience, an adaptive memory system should be able to keep what we need and what we want. Um, we know from neuroscience that there's a circuit of brain regions that utilizes the neurotransmitter dopamine. And uh, this dopaminergic circuit is uh, many people associated with reward. But as it turns out, it's not just getting a reward, but rather motivating you to seek rewards, or what Kent Barrage calls wanting. And one of the things that we know from systems neuroscience is, is that dopamine actually stabilizes synaptic plasticity, so it can help stabilize memory soon after they're formed. And so motivation may be actually influencing memory consolidation via the circuit. And we've done some studies, many other people have done some great studies on this topic. But for the most part in the real world, we don't learn because somebody's paying us or because we're going to get something out of it that's tangible. But really we do it because we want to find out information. And so I had a postdoc in my lab named Matthias Gruber. And Matthias came to my lab with the idea of studying curiosity. Now, initially at the time, I thought, well, this is a flaky topic. Why in the world would you want to study this? Uh, but Matthias was right, and I was wrong, like many of my postdocs tend to be. Um, so he, uh, what Matthias said was, uh, you know, he pointed us to some studies. And one of the interesting things about curiosity is um, that it actually resembles, in certain ways, studies of reward, in that people theorize about curiosity that it stimulates an itch to find information. So if you know something, but then somebody asks you a question and they expose a gap in your knowledge or what's called an information gap, you have this drive or this itch to go seek the information that you need to resolve that uncertainty. And this is kind of a basic drive that we might have that allows us to explore the world. And so um, the idea is, is that when we have these information gaps, we are motivated to find information. And what we hypothesized was when that happens, you get an interaction between these dopaminergic regions and the hippocampus, which we've known for many reasons to think uh, is important for forming uh, memories for new episodes and new events. And so what we predicted is, is that if we can stimulate people's curiosity, we should be able to get them into a state that enhances learning and memory. And so in this paradigm, what we did was we, used, we built on some work by Kang et al., which was actually in psychological science, where they used trivia questions as a way of stimulating people's curiosity. And so what we do is we show people a bunch of trivia questions, just like the kind that you might get at a pub quiz if you're uh, into going to pubs, let's say. And so we give people these questions, and we just ask them, do you know the answer? And if you don't, on a one to six scale, how curious are you to learn the answer to this question? And so. In the scanner, we can take some of these questions where they don't know the answer. And what we can do is we can say, OK, here's some of these questions. And we know ahead of time they're either really curious or they're not very curious to find out the answers to these questions. 
And we show them the question, but we keep them in suspense before they get the answer. So it's kind of like if you're watching Breaking Bad and it's commercial and you don't have it recorded, you can't fast forward it, and you're stuck waiting and waiting. And while we're, they're waiting, we say, hey, here's somebody's face. How likely is it do you think that they'll know the answer to this question? Now, we, don't, we know they know this person isn't going to know the answer to the question because it's just a face that we're showing them on a screen. But what we were interested in is not just about how curiosity drives brain activity, but whether curiosity not only helps you learn information that you're curious about, but also information that just comes along for the ride, information that just happens to be there while you're in a state of curiosity. And so what we found first was, uh, this is actually kind of, pro to me, one of the most interesting aspects of the study. Almost all of the interesting findings that we got from the study was not from the answers to these trivia questions. It was stimulated by the question itself. So a lot of what was happening in the brain was driven not by, here's the fact, learn it, but rather, here's the th question that's driving you to find this information. And so when we look at brain activity that's triggered by the question, what we can see is uh, both in the ventral tegmental area or the dopaminergic midbrain or in the nucleus accumbens, these areas of the dopaminergic circuit the more curious people were to find the answer to the question, the more brain activity we could see. So not surprisingly, perhaps, in fact, actually, uh, one of, never we got a lot of press on this, and never read the comments on your press, because it was like the Guardian wrote an article about this, and in the comments there were all these people saying, well, my mom could have told me this. And so uh, hopefully you won't feel that way, too. But your mom probably could have told you that people are better at remembering the answers to questions that you're curious about than to questions that you don't uh, have as much interest in learning the answers to. What's more interesting is, again, this is activity evoked by the question, not the answer. So they're not getting the answer. But in the hippocampus, the more activity you had during the time of the question, the more likely it would be that you would remember the answer to that information. And we don't see that differential effect for low curiosity questions in general. It's really driven by high curiosity questions. Now, during the answer, the more hippocampal activity you have, the better for everything. But the question itself stimulates activity in the hippocampus that predicts memory performance. But remember, we also said we wanted to see being in a state of curiosity, does it help you remember things that even you're not that curious about? And so what we did was we looked at memory for these faces that we showed people, um, and we tested them outside of the scanner. And the answer is, is that Actually, just showing people a face while they're in a state of high curiosity, that face comes along for the ride. So it's a small effect, but granted, this is a small manipulation. But in general, people are better at remembering faces for which they're, when they're in a state of high curiosity than if they see the face while they're in a state of low curiosity. What's more interesting is, is that this is highly variable. Some people are very curious. Some people are not very curious. And as it turns out, the people who show more of a curiosity, ah, sorry, people who show more of a curiosity bias in memory also show more curiosity-driven brain activity in the dopaminergic circuit in the hippocampus. So the work suggests that it's being in a state of curiosity can help you learn. And it's not about just you know, having some external motivation, and it's not even about knowledge per se. It's about that itch to find the knowledge that really seems to drive learning in this paradigm. Uh, there's a separate line of work I want to talk about, which is work on how we remember events in the real world. So in general, when I study memory in the lab, I'll give people a bunch of words to study. They remember some of the words. They don't remember some of the words. And we say, OK, well, the number of words they remember, that's the number of events they remember. But that's not how memory works in the real world, of course. In real experience, we have a continuous stream of experiences. But as many people have shown, especially Jeff Zaks deserves a lot of credit, we structure our experience into what more or less discrete events, OK? And so just as an example, I'll show you this. Uh, oh, actually, before I get to that, I'm so sorry. Um, we were interested in harnessing a phenomenon called the retrieval practice effect, or the testing effect. And uh, Roddy, Roddy, who will be speaking later, has done great work on this topic, showing that the act of memory retrieval can actually strengthen your ability to retain information over time. It's actually an interesting phenomenon because retrieving information about a past event doesn't necessarily help you learn it better. So if I test myself on th some things that I have to learn, I don't do any better necessarily at retaining it at an immediate delay as if I just restudied it over and over. 
But if you look, let's say, a day later or a week later, the imp improvement that you get from testing yourself is dramatic. And so some people have argued that it might even be related to the phenomenon of reconsolidation, where when you access a memory, it becomes kind of labile, and it can be strengthened or weakened depending on the kinds of circumstances that you have. So when I f fully understood this effect, I started to ask myself, well, can we harness this effect for everyday memory? And you know, on the one hand, it's nice to think that you know, if you've got lists of Spanish vocabulary words or something, you can use the testing effect to really help you. But as I said, real experiences are long and complex. And there's no way in the real world you could test yourself on every possible thing that can happen. But we took advantage of the fact that events are structured. That is, that we take our continuous experience and we break it up into more or less discrete events. Now, just to give you an idea, I'm going to do a little audience participation thing here. So I'm going to show you the scene from a TV show. And I just want everyone to pay close attention and just clap when you feel like one event has become, has ended and the next event has begun. Hello, oh, hello, hello. Uh, you remember Susan from NBC? Of course, how are you? Hi, good and, to see you. Uh, this is Kramer. Hello. Good to see you. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Susan. Tell, tell me what? Well, I... Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me one second. Hello? Oh, gee, I, I can't talk right now. Why don't you give me your home number and I'll call you later? Uh, well, I'm sorry. We're not allowed to do that. Oh, I guess you don't want people calling you at home. Uh, no. Well, now you know how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Perfect. So I think there was a broad degree of agreement. Some of you segmented more finely. Some of you segmented more coarsely. But I think everybody got that when the phone rang, one event ended and the next begun. And so what we asked is, is that Maybe if our memory is really structured in terms of these events, even if I recall just one piece of that memory, maybe the benefit of retrieval practice can spread to other parts of the same event. So let's say if you go back and you remember, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, if you remember uh, Jerry picking up the phone, you might also have a better memory for his conversation with the guy who called him as a result. And so we simulated this in kind of a dorky lab experiment where instead of, having, um, instead of having events, so to speak, we would put up scenes on the screen that would serve as a context that would allow people to group experiences into discrete events. And what we would do is we'd show people multiple objects that were associated with these scenes. And what we found behaviorally is, if I test you on, let's say, the tie, you get not just better retention at a one-day delay for information about the tie, which is called the testing effect, but you also get better retention of information about the watch. So even though I never tested you on watch, if you retrieve tie, you get better memory for watch. So in other words, when you recall tie, you don't just recall that you saw the, a tie on the screen. What you recall is the event in which it took place. And when it unfolds, you not only get a benefit in your memory for tie, but also this watch that you studied. So, we know from many, many imaging studies that when people recall an event like this, especially complex events, and uh, uh, for those of you who saw the reality monitoring symposium, that they talked about many of these studies, actually. When people recall complex events, you don't just activate the hippocampus, but you activate a whole cortical network that some people will recognize as the default network. And this network, as it turns out, carries information about the kinds of events that people are retrieving. And in fact, what we found was that if we looked while people were remembering an event and we compared those patterns of brain activity to what happened when people studied, let's say, the watch and the tie, what we found was showing people, let's say, the tie would reinstate the pattern of brain activity in the hippocampus more if they were actively retrieving it than if they were just restudying it. And so what seems to happen is, is that showing people the tie reactivates some part of the event. But then in this posterior medial network, which is shown right here, what we see is not only reactivation of the tie, but also the other item that went with it. So in other words, we see reinstatement of this whole event unfolding in the uh, posterior medial network. So given that this happens, that when we retrieve one piece of an event, we can now get a benefit to all of these other parts of the event that we didn't test people on, we have a highly efficient way of improving memory, right? Because you can precisely tag particular pieces of an event and if you can get people to recall them, you can actually strengthen their memory for all sorts of stuff as long as it's part of that same segmented event. 
And so uh, um, Tanya, a postdoc in my lab, uh, and I came up in ex with an experiment in the real world using wearable cameras to try to see if we can actually bring this outside of the laboratory and into real life events. And so this experiment, what we did was we had people do a tour of the California Raptor Center at UC Davis where people learn about different kinds of birds of prey like owls. And they're wearing wearable cameras the whole time. And so the camera is just taking pictures. Most of the pictures are pretty bad. But okay, you get pictures of like ceiling and floor and thumbs and stuff. But occasionally you get some good pictures and everybody gets a different picture. But for some of these pictures, what we do is we bring them back in the lab the next day and we either have them do retrieval practice. So we'll show them one of these pictures and we'll ask them, do you remember what was happening at the time? And so what was the fact that you were learning about? And so for instance, in this case, this would be, a f they were learning about a facial disc that's used for hearing. Um, or it might be more like what people might do when they look at like what my daughter might do when she looks at her Snapchat feed, which is she pulls up photos and goes, oh, that's a terrible picture. That's a good picture. And so they're looking at the picture, but they're not actively reinstating the event. And so what we're interested in is, does memory for the practiced information benefit from retrieval practice over restudy? But also, do you get better memory for this real world stuff that they learned at the tour that wasn't practiced? And so to do this, we can ask people questions about what was practiced and what was not practiced. And what we find is, in fact, people are significantly better at remembering information about both the practiced information and the related information that wasn't directly cued in the memory uh, in the retrieval practice session. So just the act of going back to a photo and recalling one small piece of the event gives you better memory for other parts of the event. But remember I told you that our experiences are structured into these discrete events. So is it the case that people just remember all aspects of the tour? Because if you were to have people watch a movie of the tour, say, which we did, we had a bunch of people on Amazon Mechanical Turk watch a movie of the tour, people can agree on where there are different boundaries between events. And so we can ask, well, what happens if you practice an event, I see if my glasses are not, okay. Uh, if they practice something right here, does that practice benefit spill over to something that happened after an event boundary? And the answer is no. Basically, if you retrieve one part of an event, that benefit spills over, but if you hit an event boundary, you don't get any more benefit. So what seems to happen when people retrieve part of an event is you get an unfolding, but once that event comes to a close, you don't get any further spillover into the next event. So what this work tells us is, uh, I mean, this is just a very quick tour through a couple of studies in our lab, but I, I think the point that I want you to take away from this is cognitive neuroscience isn't just about watching a bunch of brains light up and making a bunch of post hoc explanations. We can actually take ideas from both cognitive psychology and neuroscience and come up with ways that can actually be used in education or be used in the real world with tech companies, let's say, to improve people's memory in real life. And one of the kind of insights from this work is that memories are prioritized. We don't just remember everything, but we prioritize memories for retention. And we can hack that and use it by using the brain's motivational circuitry. We also know that the brain organizes information into events, and if we target specific aspects of those events, we can get memories for not, better memory not just for what we've targeted, but for other parts of the event that took place. Um, and so by taking advantage of the way memory works, we can actually improve memory both in the lab and in the real world. I wanna thank you guys for your attention, and thanks, partner, for the opportunity to talk.